the stage is yours for 25 minutes. Cool. Enjoy. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. Appreciate it. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about real-time APIs, um, particularly a little bit about uh, API gateways and API management, how those can affect your infrastructure and how uh, a little bit about Nginx can maybe help you guys as well. So brief introduction, um, I have a lot to cover in this uh, 25 minutes, but uh, I do want to introduce myself. My name is Kevin Jones. I'm a senior product manager for Nginx. Uh, I've been at Nginx for about five years now. Uh, previous to working at Nginx, I actually managed Nginx for a SRE team. So my experience is in site reliability, managing production, and uh, I'm really excited to talk to you guys about APIs today. Uh, and I'm an open book, so if you guys have any uh, questions, feel free to open them up in the chat or send me an email. My email is still kevin at nginx.com. So let's get going. So it all, uh, if you're not familiar with the, the history of Nginx, it all got started with this, this gentleman here, Igor Sisoev. Um, Igor Sisoev was the original creator of Nginx, and he created Nginx with one specific problem in mind, uh, where basically one server couldn't handle more than 10,000 concurrent connections. And so he solved the problem by a completely different architecture using Nginx um, as a workhorse for handling those connections and offloading uh, the operations that it can handle and letting the application focus on what it needs to do, right? Um, and over the years, it's adopted a lot of uh, traction. Uh, we are the number one most used web server on the internet today. Um, if you look online, there's roughly a little bit over 400 million websites running on Nginx. And uh, I think all the work that Igor and his team did on the product to make it such a reliable and useful tool has really shown over the years. Um, also, if you look at installations of Nginx or Nginx Plus, which is our commercial version, about 40%, according to our user base, are actually using Nginx as an API gateway. So it's very relevant that we are in this space um, of API access and uh, acting as an API uh, gateway or an API management tool uh, for those APIs. Um, and to, to speak to that, you know, there is a good amount of um, things that we can look at to see where the market is for APIs and why they're so important. Uh, firstly, we can look at the overall growth in APIs. So ever since uh, June of 2005, the programmable web has been uh, basically tracking the overall growth of exposed uh, APIs on the internet. And you can see over here dur during the duration of time, all the way up to the last report that they did, which was in 2013, uh, there's been a tremendous growth in those publicly exposed APIs. And this continues to be somewhat of a hockey puck growth where we see that this is just going to increase and increase more and more over time. And in fact, uh, according to Akamai's traffic review and looking at their overall API traffic, uh, about 83% of their web traffic that goes through their CDNs are actually API driven and API uh, related. Um, we also can look at uh, the total of uh, connected devices on the web. So we know that as of 2015, there were a total of 15 billion devices connected to the internet. And uh, with the adoption of newer technologies like 5G and some of the other uh, functionality that's coming down um, from microservices architectures and newer modern ways like containers to deploy applications, we're seeing that even grow more. And this is going to actually grow all the way up to about 75 billion by the year 2025, which is about an increase of about 500%. So um, the big question I asked for you guys is, are you guys ready to grow your infrastructure five times what it is today? Uh, especially if you're dealing with uh, devices that are connected to the internet uh, on the outside world. Uh, we can also look at uh, this report from the IDC, which says that overall 71% of most organizations accept, uh, basically expect to increase the amount of API traffic that they generate uh, over those two years. I think that is very telling based on the other metrics that we're tracking. Um, and you get the appointments that there is a, a strong need uh, to be able to um, serve those APIs. But uh, why, why is it important that your, your customers, your clients that are connecting your APIs have a good experience, right? Uh, well, it really comes down to, to the idea that from a performance perspective, a typical API client is external. You might have internal APIs, but the ones that you're most worried about are external APIs for security reasons, 
and for customer experience reasons, and maybe for business to business type negotiations where you're uh, transferring data between APIs. Um, and they need to be able to be accessible quickly uh, and reliably. And so if we look at um, other companies too, they actually have a consumption model where uh, their actually primary case of revenue is actually coming from these APIs as well. If you look at something like Expedia, uh, I think Expedia has about 90% of their revenue that actually comes from external APIs working with other vendors to be able to provide uh, real-time travel um, uh, capabilities to those vendors. So there's a lot to be heard. There's also the case for IOTs as well. And so if we look at the industries that are most in need of a real-time API, uh, we can look at the first, which is um, people that are using their uh, application for uh, customer experience, right? They're going to go on that app and they need to get an Uber or they need to get a Lyft. Which one's faster? Which one's more reliable? Which which one do they have a better experience with, right? So those are the users. Those are the devices, uh, applications, real clients that are using those. Uh, and then we can look at fraud, right? So like banking, like if you have a uh, um, uh, authentication framework for credit, credit authorization and, uh, you know, you have a slight delay in your uh, processing time, right? You're taking payments less as much time as you could, right? So it's all about being able to quickly validate transactions so that they don't oh, think, oh, something's wrong with my Visa card. Let me just get my American Express card and use that, right? You want to uh, try to um, give a good experience and be able to detect quickly any kind of fraudulent activity as well. So uh, real-time APIs do play a part in that. And then the last part is uh, other connected devices, particularly IoT devices, right? So these are things that are, uh, you know, Amazon, Google, all of the different uh, outlets um, here in my office. If I want to say, hey, Google, studio lights off, I can turn my studio lights off. Hey, Google, studio lights on, right? Um, if you guys have those in your, in, your, uh, in your home, you'll know. Hey, Google, studio lights on. Um, so the idea is here that we're going... Studio lights on, isn't that right? <laughs> yes, you get the idea. Everyone's using these, right? So um, if we talk about uh, real-time APIs, the idea is that clients are connecting through, they're most likely hitting more than one API, right? You don't have one API in your organization. You have probably many, many APIs that are doing many different things. And so you need something in front of that API. Typically it's called an API gateway a load balancer, reverse proxy. It has lots of names, uh, but we look at it, um, uh, it does a lot of different things, right? So when you enable something like that, uh, you're enabling an API gateway or a reverse proxy, as you might call it, to do things like routing. So being able to route the traffic appropriately based on the request that comes through. Identify that person. First of all, what API do they really need access? What version of the API do they need access to? Um, how often can they uh, get access to that API? Uh, maybe you want to redirect that user to uh, a different authentication schema based on uh, the, the HTTP request. Uh, perhaps, perhaps you want to do other things like um, require special authentication rules, right? Where you maybe say, okay, well, this client, they need to be able to pass a JSON web token as opposed to this other client can use an API key. Uh, being able to make those smart decisions on your API infrastructure. And then also just being able to not only authenticate those users, but also authorize them. So in other words, yeah, this user is authenticated through the network and they have access to this API, but how much access do they have? And being able to limit the access that they have based on all of the uh, information in the request. Also do things like uh, rate limiting, limiting the request rate of how often uh, someone who's unauthenticated can access that or someone who is. Um, being able to do additional security stuff like access control lists, like finding out, well, what country is this user in? Maybe we only want to expose this API to users in the United States. So we should take a really close granular look at uh, their um, IP information to see if they fall into a database IP in the United States. Uh, or Canada or whatever. Uh, maybe we don't wanna allow Russia uh, connections for a specific API, we can block that. Maybe we wanna block China, whatever it is. Um, and then also on top of that, being able to do advanced load balancing. So being able to accept high amounts of load when the traffic increases, if it's a situation where it's something like a retailer or like Expedia, 
um, on specific holidays where there's sales or uh, a spike in traffic, you need something that's going to sit there and, and load balance and protect your APIs um, and distribute the traffic evenly across your cluster, right? Uh, and then also caching is somewhat of a, uh, sometimes people don't think about that, but there is situations where you need to cache certain types of requests so that in the case that the API does go down completely, maybe there's some stale responses that can be cached there from the caching layer. But when you start adding all of this stuff, um, it does add a lot of complexity uh, into the application infrastructure. And so um, again, we, we look at this and we say, okay, well, um, what happens when you start doing all this stuff at the API gateway layer? Is it affecting the overall latency? In other words, are your clients getting a worse experience than they were if they were just directly cons consuming the API? Um, so the overall goal is to keep the latency down under 30 meg milliseconds um, is the really the best case scenario. Some customers uh, say that 100 milliseconds is good, uh, but most of our customers want to keep it under around 30 milliseconds and then keeping the performance up on those application servers. So allowing them to do what they need to do to serve the application um, and keep your SLA on your per instance request per second for your APIs. So latency down, request per second up. Um, and then we'd say, okay, well, over 90%, according to another survey uh, that was done, about 90% of organizations expect a latency of less than 50 milliseconds, like I was saying, while almost 60%, so more than half, actually want it to be below 20 milliseconds. So there's definitely a need for reliable real-time APIs. So how do you monitor and measure that stuff? Um, so we have a tool, I'm not saying this is the only way you should do it. You probably are gonna need to have robust logging. You probably should have something like uh, open tracing integration and some kind of way to uh, look at overall request rate. Um, I would recommend having some kind of dashboard that does that. But this is a good way to start, to just take a look at what your APIs are doing today. Uh, this is available on our GitHub and it's under Nginx Inc. GitHub under RT API. And it is open source. It's built on Golang by one of our engineers. Uh, and it actually works really well. Um, and it, it generates PDFs for your API so that you can see what your overall percentile is. So we can see, okay, well, here's the latency from top to bottom, right? Uh, or I should say from bottom to top. And then we have the overall percentile of that traffic. So of 99.9999% from zero to 99.9%, where is the curve of your API? And so the nice thing about this is it's actually giving you um, uh, a accurate look at your, your uh, millisecond response on the API by taking into account the waiting time um, of your actual uh, load balancing, uh, or sorry, of your latency tool, which is this tool. So it's gonna give you a very accurate uh, percentage for your latency. Um, you can also use just go get to install this. And this is the, the graph that you're gonna generate. And you can see here, this is a pretty good API that is responding on average, probably somewhere in the nine to 10 millisecond ratio. You can also use, if you're using Nginx, um, again, it's a very popular open source tool, but Nginx Plus is our commercial version. With Nginx Plus, we expose a bunch of extra metrics. There's over a hundred metrics that are uh, things like uh, request per second, um, current connections, connections a second. And then we have a product called Nginx Controller, which is a way to visualize and get a real in-depth look at that traffic over a long period of time. So if you can see here that you can do it by one hour, four hours, one day, two days, one weeks. Um, and I'm not saying a controller is the way to go specifically for that, but this does help if you're an Nginx uh, shop or if you're looking to adopt something like an API gateway and use Nginx, uh, this will really help you visualize your overall traffic and, and get an idea of what's going on with that. And so how, how can Nginx help? So first I like to always level set and talk about the differences between an API gateway and an API management tool. Uh, some people tend to use these and transpose these. An API gateway is what is doing all of the authentication and it's doing the authorization. It's doing the routing, being able to route that traffic, impose rate limits, handle exceptions, stuff like that. It's basically, I call it the heavy lifting because it's the workhorse. It's what's sitting probably on a container or on a virtual machine, maybe next to your application, more likely on its own dedicated instance where it's doing all the access control and 
doing the routing inside as a, a Linux binary. And then we have API management, which is the idea where you're managing that policy, you're analyzing and showing metrics like I just showed on the previous screen, and you're also providing a portal for developers to go in and give documentation about their API. Um, so there's really two sides to the story. Um, where F5 and Nginx come together is, and, and why uh, F5 actually bought Nginx, is we're very close to the code. We're very close to the API gateway spec here, uh, where we have Nginx controller, which is our API management tool. And we have Nginx plus or Nginx open source, which can be utilized as an API gateway. Um, and the idea here is that the controller is able to give you a GUI and an API that you can enforce and all your policy that you want to enable uh, your different teams to have role-based access to configure Nginx at scale. And Nginx Plus can be deployed as an API gateway, whether it's in a container or on a virtual machine or on bare metal or inside of a public or private cloud. Um, and so this is a um, uh, separate approach where the controller and the API gateway are deployed independently. Um, and so when we built the API management, we, we wanted to focus on two principles. One is we wanted to use the number one uh, Nginx, or I should say number one API gateway available, which to us, we already owned it, it's Nginx, right? So we built everything around Nginx Plus as that API gateway, right? And then we wanted to not do any artificial additives. We wanted everything to be native to the Nginx. So we wanted it to be tooling that, that we personally built and deployed uh, as a solution. So we don't use any third party uh, tools. We don't use any third party scripting. Uh, we only use native functionality that is built into Nginx or is a module that is written uh, from Nginx. That doesn't mean you can't use your own modules if you'd like to um, in certain situations, but that's what we focused on. And we also designed with uh, three things in mind. One is to be able to automate via an API. So everything that you can do through the uh, GUI, you can do through the API. This allows you to use Ansible, Chef, Puppet, or some other tool to be able to orchestrate your Nginx configuration. And we also wanted it to make it easy for microservices to be able to connect that traffic. So in order to do that, we had to make the data plane, the API gateway, very small and lightweight. And so I think right now the smallest instance of Nginx is about 34 megabytes in size. It fits in a container. And it can either be deployed next to your application as a sidecar, or it can be deployed independently in its own container. Uh, again, you can deploy it on a virtual machine or bare metal if you decide, but we wanted to be microservice friendly, right? Uh, and then we also wanted to be able to give the ability to improve uh, users' API infrastructure automatically. So this goes all the way back to the real-time API where we want the performance as a main priority and the ability to scale and and uh, do load balancing and all the good stuff that Nginx is really good at um, in that environment as well. And so we we built Controller a long time ago, but we added a new portal to that, an API management portal, which is a separate um, solution that allows you to do all of this functionality, configure the routing, configure the access control, uh, manage JSON web tokens, what kind of access they have, manage API keys, pretty much all the stuff that I showed you guys earlier on the what does an API gateway or what does a uh, reverse proxy do, we baked into that, that tab so that it's pretty much good to go. Um, and another thing that we also focused on is we decoupled the uh, API management and the API gateway. We didn't want any particular dependencies to be in place for the API gateway um, and the API management where they needed to be constantly in communication with each other. Uh, what this allows you to do is it allows you to deploy Nginx wherever it needs to be as an API gateway. And if for some reason the controller goes down or the controller needs to do some kind of database lookup or needs to do something, that's not affecting the overall latency of the request that's coming through. In other words, if I'm a user and I'm connecting to one of my APIs and I go through Nginx and Nginx needs to do some kind of um, authentication and authorization, all that functionality is baked into Nginx at that layer. So it doesn't need to make another sub, sub request to the API controller uh, or so the Nginx controller or the API management plane to decide, well, what am I gonna allow that person to do? We push all that stuff and keep it in its own runtime that is sitting next to um, wherever Nginx is running. So there's no added latency 
And this is what sets um, Nginx aside as probably the, the most reliable and fastest API, API management gateway solution on the market today. Um, and any kind of third-party scripting, we don't, we don't use. We don't uh, use Lua. We have our own engine script, which is, right, we call it JavaScript for Nginx. It used to be called engine script. Um, and we did, again, we don't use any third-party modules. Everything is native and built into Nginx um, or in the JavaScript coding that's on that API gateway. And so again, uh, just to recap, we are uh, the number. We're using the number one API gateway. Um, a lot of companies actually have built their API management tool around Nginx. They've actually used Nginx open source and built around that. Um, but we feel like ours is the number one um, available because it has no artificial additives, and uh, we have a very flexible architecture. Right? Um, they can essentially be deployed um, pretty much anywhere. Right? Whether you're running in containers. You're running in virtual machines, bare metal, uh, doesn't matter. And uh, again, we're optimized, optimized for automation. So because the controller is all API driven, if you decide, hey, I want to pump this into Ansible or Chef or Puppet or something like that, or maybe you have your own uh, you know, shell scripts and or Python scripts that you've created to do that stuff, you can easily do that just by making HTTP requests to our controller API. So thank you. Um, again, my name is Kevin Jones. Um, happy to answer some questions here right now and see if you guys have any uh, questions that I can answer for you. Hi, Kevin. Uh, one question about uh, what is the main challenge uh, behind the scenes to uh, achieve such performance and going so low into, into latency? Yeah, so I, I think one of the difficult things that some of our competitors have had to, to solve is how do you do a proper authentication and authorization uh, without doing database lookups, right? Without doing uh, sub requests to another service. Um, and I think that's the most difficult thing is um, when you're designing an API gateway is you want to have it as independent and almost give it as much power as it can to make its own decisions. Um, and so I think that's where we've kind of solved that problem for people with um, this solution. What is today the the main users of uh, uh, Nginx um, in for for API Gateway? In a sense that today we had a lot of questions. I think it's what's it related. We had a lot of questions about performance for microservices communication or service meshes, uh, right? Is it a sweet spot for Nginx? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think part of it is because the you know the overall size of Nginx is very uh, you know very small. Uh, the tarball is about three megabytes, and again, our, our smallest container is about thirty-four megabytes. And I think we've we've been being we've been used as a reverse proxy for the last you know ten years, um, and people are still using us for that. So I, I don't think there's um, as far as feature set and functionality, we have a lot of this stuff built into the product that's already there um, to sit into those microservices uh, frameworks and act as a uh, you know reliable reverse proxy. So yeah, I think. I think it lends to the, it goes all the way back to Igor's original architecture is, you know, it, it's very reliable and fast and can handle large amounts of connections. And so we're good fit there. Yeah, last question. How does a fault tolerance topology looks like using Nginx in 30 yeah, yeah, the fault tolerance, you know, there's, there's two ways people tend to do it. Um, one is they use uh, some kind of high availability. Um, we, we recommend using something like VRRP um, where you can fail over the traffic using a, a network, um, the VRP network protocol. Another common use case is to use some other, depending on where you're deploying it. If you're using it in a cloud, using another cloud load balancer to sit in front of your Nginx clusters uh, to do uh, high availability from that point. So you have a cluster of Nginx sitting behind there. Or if you're on premise, use something like an F5 LTM um, that sits in front and handles that high availability. Uh, th there is a later version too, where you could use something like global DNS too, if you decided to. But uh, I think that's usually a last resort because um, you have to worry about DNS propagation and doing failover can be a little tricky. But for some people, if you're in multiple availability zones, that's um, that's your only option is using something like either Route 53 or uh, a GTM if you're using F5 uh, to do global traffic management. Yeah, thank you, Kevin, for answering the questions.